Well, good morning, everybody. This is AO New Hire Class. What is it? 23-001. How are we doing this morning? Doing great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. What's happening? Morning. Hi. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning, good morning good everybody. Good morning. I always like to play that song the day after HP Pro because HP Pro is a somewhat challenging for folks from time to time. So that's my way of saying I apologize. But I guarantee that as you start to use it more and more, it will not be that bad. For all of you that stuck around yesterday and shared quality time with me, thank you. I hope it was worth your time to do that. Let's go through and let's ask some folks, what... Did we do yesterday after class? Amina Hamad, what did you do yesterday after the course was over? Um, I got with my higher up and we went over um, role playing and the script. Nice. Which script did you go over? I went over the veteran script. Okay, awesome. Not the phone call script, but the actual presentation? Yeah, the actual presentation. Okay, awesome. Good to hear. That's great. And now that you Kind of role play it with your upline does it seem daunting to you no i'm very comfortable with scripts so it's it's very easy all right awesome i'm glad to hear that uh sandra taylor what about you what did you do yesterday after class <clears throat> i did the same thing i role played a little bit with joel over the presentation script and then um we worked on the homework together awesome okay great how many people with a show of digital hands actually listened to phone calls yesterday So they're starting to come in. All right, quite a few people listen to phone calls. Okay, that's awesome, thank you. You can put your hands down. Who observed the presentation yesterday? Uh, Tamiko, did you observe a presentation? I did. Outstanding, can you tell us about it? Certainly. Um... From what I understand, the presentation was done by someone who's just been in the business, I believe, just a few weeks. Um, <laughs> Who they was went, that? Her name is Michelle. Michelle. You don't know her last name? I do not recall her last name. Okay, no worries. So Michelle was um, doing How did it go? So it went extremely well. Um, when we got to the end, um, I know Brenna said that she gave up just a tad bit of power because there was a lot of rebuttal back and forth about pricing. Uh -huh. um, and regardless of how she made the adjustments within HP Pro, um, the veterans were very adamant about not being able to afford. Okay, got you. So it wasn't um, a thing, correct? I'm sorry? It was not a sale? There was no sale. However, she was able to commit to follow up in six months um, when they could reassess their budget because they weren't interested in the product. It just didn't fit within their financial needs. Okay. And uh, one last question on Michelle. Did you, how closely did she follow the script? Uh, she was dead on. She followed very well. It, and it, it didn't sound like she was reading was mm -hmm. very conversational. Great. That's awesome to hear. Clonetta, did you observe a presentation yesterday? Yeah, it was the same exact one. Oh, I hate what yeah. I do. Okay. <laughs> <in the> same <laughs> group. No worries. Mohammed, did you observe a different presentation? Yeah, I observed the presentation by Elk. Okay, how'd that go? It was long. It was about, I think it was a little over two and a half hours. It was, it was successful. He was able to follow the whole script, and he he was basically he wasn't sure whether he was going to get the guy uh -huh. at the start, so he wanted to go for referrals first, which he did end up getting, and then he ended up getting the uh, getting a uh, uh, his basic pass uh, package out to him. So when you say he went hours. for uh, right, okay, so two and a half hours. But when you say he went for referrals first, did he follow the script? Yeah, he followed the script, but it was it was one of those uh, ones where it was like shaky whether he was going to commit to the insurance package or not. Okay, 
But it was a yeah, sale. Yeah, followed the script, and he ended up getting the sale in the end as well. All right. Awesome. Did you see anything in the, what did you say, two and a half hours? Did you see anything that you can't do? Uh, not that I can't do without experience. Just, sure, just sure. Take I understand. Some, it, take some time. Look, it just look, it didn't look like something that ultimately you don't think you're confident you can end up doing, correct? No, no. Uh, everything there looked like some, everything I expected and, yeah, and okay, nothing perfect. like I can't. All right. One last person who observed a different presentation, John Shreve. Did you observe a different presentation? Um, yes, I did. I actually went with my upline because it is my son-in-law. So I was at his office while he was uh, on the phone with uh, three different appointments he had. Wait, who? Who? I forget your upline. What's his uh, name? Again? Sean Sean Feistimal. Oh, Feistimal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a email from him yesterday. Okay, awesome. How did it go? Um, the first appointment was at seven o'clock. It went very well. Um, mm -hmm. He followed the script. He got eight different leads. Uh, unfortunately, they were going through a um, mortgage trouble. Their house is being like repossessed kind of at the time <laughs> mm -hmm. so they couldn't really sell them anything else other than uh what they actually came there for for the two thousand dollar certificates and that um the second appointment uh the lady had two duis within five months at, or within five years after speaking to him about an hour about everything <laughs> Ouch. yeah so that kind of shot that and then the 11 p.m appointment um said they're going to call back and they never called him back and when he called they he just left a voicemail so okay and then we did about 50, we did 50 different calls too, like cold calling. Call call. Call for them. Yeah, that's we did true. 50 of those, yeah. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's good to hear that you got, a lot of you were doing that and uh, putting that together or observing presentations and listening to phone calls. So that's really good. So yesterday was a day, obviously, <clears throat> folks on HP Pro and really giving you an overview of HP Pro in general and then specifically about uh, setting up the options. Sorry about that. I have a little bit of a cough. Okay. So we are now going to, we got to watch the videos. There's no way out of that. Uh, I think all of you have the, uh, or I sent it out, right? The, was it the credit union video link or was it the veteran link I sent out? I forget which one. But what I'll do while I'm playing it, I will send both links out to you so that you can, uh, watch that if we have lagging or something like that but just know it is a requirement that we have to play both of those uh through almost their entirety and then after that we're going to practice building well first i'm going to do the homework with you and then we're going to practice building different options in breakout rooms okay clinetta your hand is still raised was that from before or do you have a question no it was from before sorry oh uh, yeah no no worries so we got 92 people in here. I increased uh, my capability last night so I can handle up to 500 people. So if you all get busy and start recruiting like crazy, then we'll have everybody in here. But I'll probably change my format just a tad in order to do that. So just bear with me a second while I share my screen. And we will watch the first video. The veteran market module is intended to give you a clear picture of the clients that you'll be servicing and the organizations that they belong to. So here's what you need to take away from this module. Number one, what defines a veteran and what are they covered for and entitled to through the VA? Number two, what a veteran service organization is. And number three, how do we market to veterans? A veteran by statute is defined as a person who served in the active Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guard, and was discharged as other than dishonorable. Now, there's currently over 20.4 million veterans across the country, making the veteran market almost one and a half times the size of the entire union market that the company began marketing to in the 50s. Our target senior demographic of veterans between the ages of 60 to 75 alone boasts more than 10 million or a little under half of the veteran population. What's more exciting than just the number of veterans that exist is the opportunity to protect each one of those veterans' families and close relations through the sponsorship program provided through AIL. Every veteran, not only in most cases, always knows another veteran, but also may have a brother or sister or a parent or a friend that they're able to extend their benefits to through AIL as well. You may be asking yourself with that many veterans, 
Well, where are they all located at? Well, in Washington state, there's over 560,000 veterans. In Oregon, there's over 300,000. In California, has over 1.6 million. Arizona, over 500,000. In Texas, over 1.5 million. In Minnesota, over 320,000. In Wisconsin, over 360,000. Virginia, over 720,000. North Carolina, over 730,000. Tennessee, over 470,000. And that's not even all the territories that we cover and service veterans in. What an incredible opportunity that you have to work in this special market. Now, to put this in perspective for how big your opportunity is, let's take a state like Washington. It has over 560,000 veterans, with 397 of those being between the ages of 20 to 69 or 71%. It would take 25 agents averaging 12 presentations per week or 300 presentations in total. It would take those 25 agents almost 39 years to see every veteran and their family in Washington. Now that's just one state with 25 agents and you have access and the exclusive in AO to the whole country. Now, if that's not opportunity unlimited, I don't know what is. Now let's talk about what they're covered for. Burial in a VA National Cemetery includes an assigned grave site if space is available, opening and closing of the grave, grave liner for casket remains, headstone or marker, and finally, care at no cost to the family. Now, the easiest way to understand that is everything before the cemetery gates, the veteran and their family is responsible to take care of. If they're buried in a state or national cemetery, the VA will take care of everything past the cemetery gate. Now, the US Department of Veteran Affairs benefits does not cover all of the funeral or cremation arrangements of honorably discharged veterans. They get up to $300 for a burial allowance if at the time of death, they were entitled to receive a pension. They receive up to $762 for a burial allowance if the death occurs in a VA facility, up to $762 for a burial allowance if their burial in a cemetery is not under U.S. governmental jurisdiction, discharged from active duty because of a disability incurred in the line of duty, or they die in a VA facility, up to $2,000 for service-related deaths, and veterans' caskets are not free unless the death occurs while on active duty. Now, I know if you're like me, you feel the same way that I do. That's just not enough to take care of their funeral or final expenses for them, let alone their families. But that is where you come in. And your ability to complete this training effectively will be crucial to helping and educate and protect our nation's veterans. If you happen to encounter an active duty veteran member or spouse, it's important to know what life insurance they are covered for. It's called SGOI, or Service Members Group Life Insurance. Every active duty member is covered for $400,000 of term life insurance for the period of active duty and for an additional 120 days after separation or release from duty. Now, SGLI can be converted to VGLI, or Veterans Group Life Insurance, for up to the full $400,000 of renewable term life insurance if full-time SGLI was in place when they separated. If the veteran applies for VGLI within 240 days of separating, they don't have to qualify medically. Outside of that, they have a year and 120 days to apply and qualify medically. Otherwise, VGLI is not available to the veteran. Now, please review the module materials to see the details and the rates and coverages for VGLI and so that you can get the facts and utilize them throughout the presentation, which you'll see in later modules. Now that you know what defines a veteran and how many they are and what they're covered for, let's talk about the organizations that support them. The groups that we work with and also service veterans are called VSOs or Veteran Service Organizations. The three major VSOs are the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and finally, the AMVETS, totally in over 3.85 million members across the U.S. Now, once you know the structure of one of them, you know the structure for all of them. So we're going to focus on the VFW, which is the second largest of the big three VSOs, with 1.6 million members. Now, the VFW represents combat veterans that had boots on the ground overseas for more than 30 days. Along with the VFW, there's an auxiliary to that organization. Now, these auxiliary members are not actual veterans themselves. And in many cases, they are the wives or husbands, sons or daughters of a veteran. 
The auxiliary's purpose is to help support and transition veterans back into civilian life once they've separated from service. Spouses, dependents, and survivors are eligible for a presidential memorial certificate, a burial flag, and surviving spouses and children, they may be eligible for burial in a national cemetery, even if they pre-deceased the veteran. For the most up-to-date figures and numbers, be sure to visit www.cem.va.gov. To give you a better picture of VSOs and their impact, let's check out a video that shows what happened in the VFW organization in recent years. The VFW's 121st year was marked by challenges like none we have seen before, yet we did not falter. The call for help was unrelenting, and our members remained determined to serve during a time of great need. On July 24, 2020, Al Roach II was installed as National Commander-in-Chief during a change of command ceremony at VFW National Headquarters. A U.S. Air Force veteran who served in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Commander Roche understood the value of resolve, resilience, and adapting to the situation at hand. All things he commended BFW members for as they stepped up to help during the COVID-19 crisis. In casting his 2020 vision for veterans, Commander Roche called on each of us to stay committed to the VFW's mission and continue growing membership in the nation's largest combat veterans organization. As the pandemic created or heightened hardships, the VFW found new ways to accomplish that mission. Limited in-person interaction moved more opportunities online through events such as the Facebook Live discussion with U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs officials on resources for veterans facing homelessness and a live virtual chat with Medal of Honor recipient Thomas Payne. We even launched Still Serving, the VFW podcast, as one more way to connect with our community and highlight critical issues and legislation affecting veterans, service members, and military families worldwide. And we've stayed on top of threats to veterans' benefits, such as the rise of VA claim sharks. These unaccredited companies make unrealistic promises regarding help with VA claims and they keep a portion of a veteran's disability compensation as payment for assistance that accredited VFW service officers provide at absolutely no charge to the veteran. VFW posts and members also adapted to life in the pandemic by holding virtual events, along with safely serving fellow veterans and their communities. At every level of the organization, service and camaraderie have illustrated that the VFW is a lifeline for veterans their families, and communities. Primarily through virtual meetings, the VFW persevered on the front lines of vital legislative battles on Capitol Hill. Nothing stopped us from fighting for education, jobs, health care, and better quality of life for veterans as we made the voices of our members heard. The VFW proposed the Digital GI Bill upgrade to bring VA education services into the 21st century. This would improve veterans' access to timely and accurate processing as they complete an education. We also pushed for more assistance for service-disabled veterans and those facing housing issues, reflecting our desire to see all veterans secure employment and economic opportunities. The VFW advocated for more progress in healthcare for women veterans, including continued needs to eliminate harassment and assault and address a lack of facilities and providers for gender-specific services. The VFW expressed support for H.R. 344, the Women Veterans Transitional Residents Utilizing Support and Treatment Trust Act, which would identify the need for women-specific drug and alcohol dependency treatment and rehabilitation programs through VA. VFW service officers remain steadfast in their efforts to secure the benefits and compensation America's veterans earned and deserve. 
our accredited VFW service officers and VFW National Veterans Service set another fiscal year record, recovering more than $9.7 billion in VA disability compensation benefits for nearly 550,000 veterans. One of the most urgent concerns for the VFW was toxic exposures. Men and women who've worn our nation's uniform and served in dangerous environments need the care and benefits America promised. They've sacrificed, but too many have been left to suffer as they waited years or decades for benefits, or worse yet, were denied care. Commander Roche demanded Congress take action during the first ever all virtual testimony before the House and Senate Committees on Veterans Affairs. He provided a plan that would establish an independent commission to identify toxic exposures and environmental hazards, evaluate scientific evidence on health conditions and toxic exposures, and obligate the VA to accept toxic exposure claims for the sake of veteran care, regardless of the cost. Toxic exposure for our troops has been synonymous with service for more than a hundred years. But every time we're faced with it, we act as, it's never, as if it's never happened before. A comprehensive system for taking care of our troops exposed to hazards is long past due. The VFW demands that Congress works in a bipartisan manner with the veteran service organizations to develop a comprehensive solution for toxic exposure. We must create a framework that will take care of all past, present, and future generations of veterans. Again, that is long overdue. Right now, the burden of proof falls too heavily on veterans. A new framework to determine presumptive service connection is necessary. The VFW continues to urge Congress to pass reforms. We emphatically support the Comprehensive and Overdue Support for Troops Cost of War Act and the Honoring Our Pact Act currently under consideration. The lives of veterans are at stake. These advocacy efforts reflected the VFW's 2021 priority goals and the legislative battles that must be won for veterans and their families. The VFW provided several artifacts and personal effects to the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency as part of its promise to help advance POW MIA missions. B.J. Lawrence, Executive Director, VFW Washington Office, met with DPAA Director Kelly McKegg to hand over items from VFW members. Shortly after, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper delivered several of these items to the Vietnamese government as a show of goodwill from the U.S. The VFW Foundation proudly celebrated its 25th anniversary. To mark the occasion, the city of Kansas City, Missouri presented Resolution 25, the Veterans of Foreign Wars Foundation Day Resolution. VFW Foundation Board Secretary Treasurer and VFW Quartermaster General Deborah Anderson and other representatives attended the virtual meeting to accept the resolution. <laughs> With the generous support of our wonderful and loyal corporate partners, the VFW made a positive difference for Americans of every generation. Patriotic middle and high school students received more than $208,000 in scholarships and awards as the VFW named the national winners of its 2021 Voice of Democracy and Patriots Pen competitions. The VFW hosted its first ever virtual parade of winners live on Facebook. The event, sponsored by Twisted X, recognized all state winners of the Voice of Democracy competition, as well as the national Voice of Democracy and Patriots Pen winners. Viet Okay, so we're going to cut the video for that one there, and we're going to show the credit union one, because I don't think we need to watch the entire thing all over again. The credit union market module is intended to give you a clear picture of the clients that you're going to be servicing. So here's what you need to take away uh, from this video. Number one, what is a credit union and how are they different from a bank? Number two, you know, what is the marketing approach with credit unions and how will resources work within the market? And number three, how is your virtual presentation tailored to the credit union market? Now, before we get into the marketing approach and the specifics of the virtual credit union presentation, let's check out a video that's going to walk you through 
what a credit union is, inform you about the credit union movement, educate you on the history of credit unions, and finally, review the philosophy of credit unions. Go ahead and take a look. Wow, and thank you for joining us today for a look into the credit union movement and philosophy. Today, we will look into four key areas of credit unions. What is a credit union, the credit union movement, credit union history, and the credit union philosophy. First, let's talk about the age old question. What is a credit union? A credit union is a cooperative financial institution owned and controlled by the people who use its services. These people are their members. Credit unions serve groups that share something in common, such as where they work, live, or worship. Credit unions are not for profit and exist to provide a safe, convenient place for their members to save money and to get loans at reasonable rates. Credit unions, like other financial institutions, are closely regulated. The National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, administered by an agency of the federal government called the National Credit Union Administration, or NCUA, ensures deposits of credit union members at federal and state chartered credit unions nationwide. Deposits are insured up to $250,000. What makes a credit union different from a bank? These financial institutions accept deposits and make loans, but unlike credit unions, banks are in business to make a profit. Banks are owned by groups of stockholders whose interests include earning a healthy return on their investments. Credit union membership varies based on what the credit union stated field of membership is. Many employers sponsor their own credit unions and employees of these companies, as well as their family members can join. Others can be based on your location. If you live, work, go to school, or worship in a certain geographic location, you may meet the requirements of that credit union. Others are group-based. For example, it would be a credit union based on a specific place of worship. Anyone affiliated with that group, regardless of where they work or live, could join. Now we turn our attention to the credit union movement. The first credit union sprang up in Germany in the 1850s and 1860s and were designed to meet the savings and loans needs of small agricultural communities. As the 20th century began, Alphonse Desjardins created the first credit union in Canada to meet the financial needs of poorer and more vulnerable sectors of his community that were often taken advantage of by unethical lenders. Canada's successful efforts profoundly influenced two Americans, Pierre Jay, the Massachusetts Banking Commissioner, and Edward Feline, a Boston merchant. The two men helped organize public hearings on credit union legislation in Massachusetts, leading to passage of the first state credit union act in 1909. Growth in the industry was slow. Fewer than 10 states passed credit union laws. Alphonse Desjardins was instrumental in forming the Canadian and U.S. credit union movements. Besides helping to found the first credit unions in Canada and the U.S., he pioneered youth savings clubs and school banks to introduce the concept to the youth of the day. Roy Bergengren was an American attorney and pioneer of the United States credit union movement. Hired by Edward Feline in July 1921 to head the Credit Union National Extension Bureau, Bergengren carried out an ambitious legislative agenda that resulted in the enactment of the Federal Credit Union Act, the creation of the Credit Union National Association, or CUNA, and the foundation of thousands of credit unions across the United States. The key principles of the credit union movement were volunteerism, self-help, one member, one vote, and the consideration of a person's character as well as net worth. As you can tell, the credit union idea is a simple one. People should be able to pool their money and make loans to each other. It's an idea that evolved from cooperative activities in 19th century Europe. Since that time, guiding principles have remained the same. In 1934, President Roosevelt signed into law the Federal Credit Union Act, which promoted savings and made credit available to a nationwide network of nonprofit credit unions. The New Deal initiative was based on the Massachusetts Credit Union Act of 1909. 
the legislation allowed credit unions to be chartered either under federal or state law, a policy that remains in place today. The first official Credit Union Day was celebrated on the third Thursday in October 1948. That celebration is now known as International Credit Union Day. In 1970, the Credit Union National Administration became an independent federal agency. Congress also created the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund to protect deposits at credit unions. The 1970s also brought major changes in the products offered by financial institutions, and credit unions too found they needed to expand their services. In 1977, federal legislation allowed U.S. credit unions to offer new services to their members, including share certificates and mortgages. Credit unions grew tremendously during the 1970s. The number of credit union members more than doubled during the decade, and credit union assets tripled to more than $65 billion throughout the 1990s and into the start of the 21st century. In 1934, when credit unions were helping Americans through the Great Depression, the treasurer of a Midwestern credit union said that credit unions were not for profit, not for charity, but for service. That philosophy holds true today. Earlier, we discussed several different examples between a credit union and a bank. They are all equally important and are worth repeating, such as credit unions are not for profit financial cooperatives. They are financial institutions that must generate enough profit to provide dividends to members, to continually improve services and build institutional reserves for the safety and soundness of the future of the credit union. But their mission is social and credit unions exist to serve their members, not make a profit. Earnings are returned to members in the form of lower rates, higher interest on deposits and lower fees on services. Federal credit unions are tax exempt, which was established in 1937, affirmed by the statute in 1951, and reaffirmed in 1998 in H.R. 1151, the Credit Union Membership Access Act. This act states credit unions, unlike many other participants in the financial services market, are exempt from federal and most state taxes because credit unions are member owned, democratically operated, not-for-profit organizations. They are also generally managed by volunteer boards of directors, and because they have the specific mission of meeting the credit and saving needs of members, especially persons of modest means. Credit unions, like all other cooperatives, operate under the seven cooperative principles. These include voluntary membership, Credit unions are voluntary, cooperative organizations offering services to people willing to accept the responsibilities and benefits of membership without gender, social, racial, political, or religious discrimination. Many cooperatives, such as credit unions, operate as not-for-profit institutions with volunteer boards of directors. In the case of credit unions, members are drawn from defined fields of membership. Democratic member control. Cooperatives are democratic organizations owned and controlled by their members. One member, one vote, with equal opportunity for participation in setting policies and making decisions. Members' economic participation. Members are owners. They contribute to and democratically control the capital of the cooperative. This benefits members in proportion to the transactions with the cooperative rather than on the capital invested. For credit unions, which typically offer better rates, fees, and services than for-profit financial institutions, members recognize benefits in proportion to the extent of their financial transactions and general usage. Autonomy and independence. Cooperatives are autonomous, self-help organizations controlled by their members. If the cooperative enters into agreements with other organizations or raises capital from external sources, it is done so based on terms that ensure democratic control by the member and maintains the cooperative autonomy. Education, training, and information. Cooperatives provide education and training for members, elected representatives, managers, and employees 
so they can contribute effectively to the development of the cooperative. Credit unions place particular importance on educational opportunities for their volunteer directors and financial education for their members and the public, especially the nation's youth. Credit unions also recognize the importance of ensuring the general public and policymakers are informed about the nature, structure, and benefits of cooperatives. Cooperation among cooperatives. Cooperatives serve their members most effectively and strengthen the cooperative movement by working together through local, state, regional, national, and international structures. Concern for community. While focusing on member needs, cooperatives work for the sustainable development of communities, including people of modest means, through policies developed and accepted by the members. Credit unions continue to look out for their members' interests with empathy and understanding and provide a level of service that is not generally available at other financial institutions. Whether it's providing a loan to help a member cover unexpected medical bills, giving financial counseling to a member, or simply offering a better deal on a used car loan, credit unions make a difference for their members and the communities they serve. Now that you've been educated on what a credit union is, how they work, and the market's history, you know, let me ask you, are you a credit union member? Uh, if you are, great. If you aren't, be sure to research a local credit union in your community and see how you can become a member. You know, just like you be... Okay, awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, so we watched that. We have an idea now, both the markets, and that's really the intent of that entire, uh, or both of those videos, right? The market for the veterans and the market for <clears throat> credit union. Our class number is 23-001. All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's go to HB Pro, <clears throat> and let's see if I can actually get this stuff done in a timely fashion for everybody. So let's go to, pardon me just a second, turn the participants off. Okay, let's go to Mildred Oliveras. Mildred, you're gonna give me a scenario and I'm actually going to build it in HB Pro, okay? Just any scenario? Yes, any scenario. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is launch HB Pro. And instead of going through and doing the entire presentation, I'm just going to go down here in the lower left hand corner on pre-plan. I want to click on pre-plan, pre, pre and this is now going to come up. And Can you this try to share your screen? We're not seeing what you're doing. Oh. <laughs> screen was being shared. Thanks for letting me know. No. Okay, so here we go. All right. All right, so let's start over. Boom, I'm at this screen right here. You all can see it? Yes. Okay, we're at the screen right here. Instead of going in here and doing all this stuff for now, I just want to show that I can build the options as we learned yesterday. So in the lower left-hand corner, I'm going to click on pre-plan. And then this screen is going to come up, which is the exact same screen that you would get uh, when you're in the plan generator. Okay. So what is the name of the first person? Hello? We're doing credit union. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's credit or not. Right now, all we're doing is building the plans. Okay. Uh, we'll do Ben. Ben, okay. And Ben is how old? 53. 53. And his wife's name? Amy. Amy. How old is she? 56. 56 and female and I'll just pick California, okay? Or Alabama, it doesn't matter. Pick the first one. Okay, so, uh, whoops, cancel that. I am here at this screen where, where I begin. So what I want you to do, Mildred, if I make a mistake, I want you to stop me and tell me where I made a mistake, okay? Okay. All right, so we're gonna use the hour power because uh, either they're in the veteran market or they're in the <coughs> credit union market. Uh, sorry, we're going to use the dollar day because they're in the veteran market or they are in the credit union market and they're retired. So I know the first plan I want to build is right in the middle at $5 a day. So I'm going to put this at $5 a day and I'm going to put her at $5 a day as well. Then the first thing I'm going to do is going to change this to 575. 
triple family. Thank you. Five dollars a day right there. I'm going to move that to triple family. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. Oh, I can't do that. I'm going to move her to 20 or him to $25,000. And I'm going to move her to $25,000. I'm waiting for you, Mildred. Okay. And they have two children. Mildred, that's a mistake, right? What's a mistake? Well, I'm not supposed to change anything in here yet. Whatever uh, comes up is what I should leave alone, right? Okay. Not used to that. Okay. And then the purpose of building this, yeah, I can have children, but I'm not going to enter them in because it makes no impact to the cost yet. Okay. okay. The reason for that is because she's already there, Amy. So I'm already going to do a family, which is triple family right here. Yes, Sade, you have a question. Yes, hi. Um, I know you kind of went over it um, yesterday. What's the difference between like a triple individual versus a triple family? So if I don't have a person here, right? So no Amy, she has no age and she uh, right here. What ends up happening is I then get individual only because it's for that individual. If I have a family like a spouse or I have children, then I have the ability to do family. What that means is individual is just for one policy owner. Family means I can cover the spouse and the children as well with the A71 product. Okay. Even if it's, um, you know, double family, triple family, whatever. Even at that point, we're just saying the difference between uh, individual and family. Individuals for one person, family is for that one person plus a spouse and or children. Okay. Thank you. Or Stokes, what do you got for me? Did you pick triple family because that's the silver tier as well? You're starting in the middle? Starting in the middle, so I'm picking triple family. For the purposes of what we're doing in class, this is what I want you to do every single time. When you get in the field and you're doing your own thing, you can pick whatever you want. What we're teaching you is start in the middle, provide an upsell, and, and provide a way to downsell, okay? So I start in triple family. I do not touch anything in here. The next thing I'm going to do is do what? Go to allocate remaining? Is that correct, Mildred? Yes. Okay, so I'll go to allocate remaining. I'm going to allocate both, but I can't. Why is that, Mildred? You didn't add Amy into the... I need to have like, Amy added with the check mark in order for the allocate remaining to show both over here. So then I'm going to allocate both, and then it goes to zeros or close enough to zero that I'm happy, right? So now I'm good right there. So silver plan is done. Now I need to create the other two plans, right? I need to create the gold. And I need to create the bronze. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to click on plan options. I'm going to change the name of this one to e to uh, what? I'm going to call it recommended or the silver plan. I'm going to do the very next one. And it's going to be the essential plan. And then the next one is going to be the uh, comprehensive plan. Did I do that correctly, Mildred? Uh, yesterday you had silver, gold, and bronze, but it... it needs to be that way because if I don't do that, then when I present it to the client, they're in the wrong order. Okay. So once I put those in the correct order, so it's always should be silver, then gold, then bronze or recommended comprehensive and essential. Then I'm going to click that so that they show up. All right. And when they show up, the first one is going to be recommended. The other two are just going to be copies of that one currently for right now. I'm going to click on comprehensive, and the first thing I'm going to do on comprehensive, once the, all the blue shows up, is I'm going to change the amount up here. So in this one, <clears throat> normally I tell you guys eight bucks, right? Some number that's going to be higher. So let's do eight dollars just to make it easy. So eight dollars, and the next thing I'm going to do, I don't care about the stuff down here. I want to change this to the highest possible that's available to me. In this case, it's quintuple family. Now that that is done and they're at $8, I can allocate the remaining so that the insurance that I'm going to provide actually meets the budget. So 304.16, 486.67. Then I'm going to go to the bronze or otherwise known as the essential. I'm going to click on that. Once all the gray shows up, I'm going to drop this down to a lower number, but still leave me some room that if I need to downsell, I still make a little bit of money. So now I'm down to $3. 
for, whoops, $3 for each one of them, okay? Then the next thing I'm gonna do is drop this down to the double family. And when I do that, I don't care about this. I'm gonna to go to allocate remaining. I'm gonna allocate both. And then these should be zeros and they are, I'm now good. And the very next thing I'm gonna do is click on recommended because if I didn't click on recommended and I click display plan, it will display whatever plan I had highlighted here. You don't wanna display your lowest plan to the client because now you're selling to the lowest plan, right? You wanna to sell to the recommended plan so you can either go up or you can go down. In this case, we don't have the ability to display the plan because I'm in the pre-plan screen as opposed to the plan generator. When I click on the benefit summary, now I can see that I'm displaying the correct plan. I can talk to all these issues. And if I use display plan, I can hit my down arrow and then each thing will show up appropriately. In the veteran market, what shows up first is the life insurance benefits. In the credit union market, what shows up first is the hospital accident benefits. Again, 30418, 4667, 18250. And the way you can look at that is $117,000 in total coverage there, $314,000 in total coverage there. And this seems to be a bit off on the recommended, right? Oh, no, it's right in the right order. Recommended, the comprehensive, then essential. Samuel? Hold on a second, JV. In practice, when you guys get used to doing this, I guarantee you it'll take you 30 seconds. It does not take that long to build the plan, the options, to present to somebody, it really doesn't. It, 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 for those of you who watched the presentation last night, who watched Michelle? Who was that person that watched Michelle? Doris, that was you? Yeah, there was a few of us from class in there. Okay, how long did it take Michelle to actually, from the time like that 60, she- 60 seconds, literally. Like a minute, maybe a minute <coughs> and a half. It was really fast. Okay, so the key there is just making sure that you actually Build it correctly, <laughs> right? Because if you don't and you present it, now you're going to either sell to what you presented or you're going to try to overcome a lot of objections, which in my experience uh, is takes time and time usually means sales are challenged. All right, JV, so apologize. Go ahead. What do you got for me? Um, for the comprehensive one, and let me see. Like the comprehensive and... JV, so what's your question? I like the word of essential, comprehensive, and recommended be on there like by default? No, you, I showed you exactly what to do. Did you watch what I just did? Yes, I just saw it. Okay, so I actually had to change the names when I added those two additional plans. I'm just saying, like, when I actually start and do this, Am I going to do it on this app or like, like will, will the plan options be already be generated for me? Hello? Yeah, I'm trying to think about how to answer your question. So when you first start any presentation whatsoever, there are no plans in the system. You are the one that's building the plan options. Okay. Okay. Can I uh, like put first, second, and third? Well, you can certainly do that, but the thing then becomes the client is thinking, If are you in the veteran market, JVs? Yes. Okay, so your client is, based on the text in the presentation, the client is hearing you say that the VSOs recommend. If you don't put recommend in there, you just put one, two, three, then how are they going to know what the VSO actually recommended? Okay, you're right, you're right. Okay, awesome. All right. So do I have any questions about how I just built that plan? Yes, Nick, go ahead. Uh, can we go back to the beginning um, where you started you started to build the plan? Because I'm going through the needs analysis before I can do anything. Yeah, well, I, I did I told you not to go to the needs analysis, if okay. you remember. Right, so here's my screen. Actually, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to home and we're gonna get out of this. And what I said is right here at this screen, in order to practice building options, I do not want you to go and put a client name and other and all that stuff. Go down to the lower left-hand corner, 
click on free plan down here. Do you see that? I do. When you click on that, that'll take you to this screen and that way you don't have to do the needs analysis. Gotcha. So all it is is ability to practice or show somebody that you don't want to do a presentation for, you can show them exactly and build a plan to them specifically. Okay. Understood. Yep. Joanne, what can I do for you? I can teach you to use the mute button. I have failed as a facilitator. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. What's up? I have a question about allocation. Um, so I know yesterday when I was doing the homework too, like one of the policies didn't allocate to, to zero. And so I guess I want to like take a step back and kind of get a better understanding of, of exactly what the allocation option does so sure. I can understand like what, what it's supposed to read there. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. So when we're in this state right here, <clears throat> uh, we'll just do the veteran because that makes it easier or the dollar a day. If I put any number in here, so the $5, right? When I put the $5, what we're doing up here is we're actually building a budget. That budget is $304.17. Right now, I'm only spending out of that budget $145.76. Okay. okay. When you allocate, what you're doing is you're adjusting the coverage amount, or really what you're adjusting is how much money you're spending on insurance in the whole life product. Yeah. You're either adjusting it up or adjusting it down. Allocation doesn't do anything anywhere else other than your whole life coverage. So that's yeah. what, right? So right now, 15 and 15 or 78 and 64 respectively, but I know I need to go up. So when I allocate, and I'm going to allocate both, you'll see that the coverage amount and this amount will go up for both equal, not necessarily equally, but it will go up. So when I allocate, boom, it jumped to 30 and 33, right? Now we know that he has less coverage for more money than her. And the reason for that is because she's a female and females live five years longer than men. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh Known fact that's the uh, actuary tables tell us that over okay. a long period of time, okay? Does that answer your question about allocation? Yeah, it actually helps me understand too because the tobacco users had, th that example was the one where they had, the, it didn't zero out all the way. And it, would that mm -hmm. be because their policy, they're having to um, spend more because they're tobacco users? So when you said, I'm not sure what you mean by zero out, but let's do this example. So here, we're, is this what you mean right here by zeroing yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're going to take tobacco users, and we know that their rate is going to be more money. So now I'm overpaying according to my budget. So I want to bring that down. So I'm going to go and allocate remaining. I'll allocate both. And when I do that, that gets me to zeros. Now, just to be clear, because of the math, you may not always get exactly to zero. Okay. And that's because it's calculated on a per day basis and the days aren't always uh, cleanly divided into the amount that you're paying every month. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. I would minus 14 cents, plus two cents, something like that. Don't worry about it because you're very close to the 304.17. So now you can see that the coverage amounts went down because they both smoke. Yeah, yeah. Got, got it. Makes sense. Thank you. More than happy to. Uh, Precious, what can I do for you? Hey, Precious, you, you can't understand me. Precious, if you can hear me, we can't understand you. Can you type your question into the chat? Because your microphone isn't coming through very well. I apologize. Uh, Nick, your hand is up. Was that from before or do you have another question? Yep. Okay. Joe Jarek, what can I do for you? Quick question. So this might sound dumb, but since we're plan, we're, we're uh, picking the plan options and um, I see that there's four options is, is, uh, is it like recommended to have like three or should we have all four options built up? Are you talking about right here? Yeah. Okay. So what happens is we built four because there's enough room for us to show four. Okay. We three, because most people who don't have sales experience, they respond favorably if you have a middle and then a higher and a lower. So if right? three is okay. We don't need to do the four. Three is okay. What you will probably find when you watch tenured agents, they'll only show two plans. Okay. 
And that's because they're doing what's called an option close. I have no problem with that if you want to do just two plants. The idea of the third plant is it gives you a fallback in case somebody tells you, hey, I can't afford that. You already have that third plan built. Okay. <clears throat> that makes sense? Yes. Okay. Dave uh, Garnett, here for you. The, in, in some of the practice um, yesterday, when you have seniors um, to build the um, comprehensive, um, because they're capped in terms of what you can sell them, um, I had to adjust like the actual cost of it because um, I couldn't like double the um, amount of the uh, recommended. Okay, so <clears throat> pardon me, let's do a senior one really quick. So that way we're all on the same page and make sure that we're seeing what you're seeing. So at 55, we're going to change that to 66 and I'm going to change her to 70. Okay. Right. We're still going to be at $5 a day. That's where we're starting out. We're going to add these products in for both Sam and Julie. And now I'm going to change this to which one? There's only two options or three options for the family, right? So pick the one that's in the middle to start with. So that's quadruple family for them. And now you can allocate the remaining. Okay. And when you allocate the remaining, this is what you end up with, about $10,000 a peach for each one of them, and that's because they both smoke. If they didn't smoke and you allocated the remaining, then the coverage would go up to $12,000 each for right. both of them. So that's I the was, one of the middle. No, I was, what I was doing was in the um, credit union and our power philosophy. Okay, so let me come to that later. That's a yeah, little okay. different animal. And yeah. I'm going to take all your credit union folks and put you in a room and walk you through what I want you to do for gotcha. the specifically because you have to do it to pass your presentation rubric but to finish this thought off here before i get the other questions when you have this in here and now you need to build the additional plans for uh the seniors right so let's just do the uh what silver if i can type correctly silver gold and bronze and again you can put recommended comprehensive and essential if you wanted to now this shows up. So at the gold, the highest level, I want to change this to the $8 a day, right? And for her, I want to change it to $8 a day as well. And again, this is to present. It's not <clears throat> that you will end up closing at this level. I mean, if you do, that's great, but you got to start with something. And we're going to change this to quintuple. And when we do that, now I can allocate the remaining and you'll see that the, uh, the amounts will uh, change to a higher level. That is still below $34,999, correct? So that's the cap. If I've just arbitrarily went in here and said, hey, I wanna give $50,000 to uh, Sam, and I try to tab over, it will cap me and tell me I can't do it. I can only go 34,999, okay? Yeah, yeah I, think the, I think the problem that I had was, um, uh, Sort of like how you adjusted from five to eight in the uh, credit union. I was going from 50 to 100. Yeah, I'll show you how to do that. So you, because you, if you do 100, it's going to blow it up, right? It's going to be too yeah. high. Okay. So now we've got that. And I'll take you credit union folks into a room and we'll walk through that. Next question, Lania Taylor, what can I do for you? Hi. So I clicked the use pre plan at the bottom. Uh, and it just like kind of disappeared. Does that go somewhere? Like, does it save somewhere? Uh, should I not click that button? You mean down here? No, that green button up. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, so what that does is that'll put it into your, so if I click pre-plan, it disappears. And now if I bring up an actual client name right here, it'll load that pre-plan into the plan generator for that client. Oh, so okay. So the, the, the reason this was designed to do, I'm using it for practice for all of you, <clears throat> but the reason it's in here at all is because there's going to be some clients that you know you're going to meet with at, you know, five o'clock tonight. And you know how old they are. You have some basic information. You can pre-plan and build your stuff up and then load it directly into uh, right here and put their name in. <clears throat> so that way you don't have to spend the time building the options during the presentation. When you move from the needs analysis 
into the plan generator, it will already be there. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Stephanie, what can I do for you? Okay, so can you go back to the um, the screen where you, you were before? I'm sorry. No, there's no reason to apologize. It's, why, it's exactly why I'm here. Okay, I'm okay. in the pre to do something okay. here. So my first question is, the hourly comes from when they tell you what they make on a monthly basis? That's correct. Okay. And um, my other question is, if they are, say they want X, um, they're curious and they want X, like $20,000 of coverage for both of them, right? And they just say, that's what I want. I'm really looking for X. Can you put that specifically in there? So certainly you could do that, but now you've got a different problem. Right. Okay. Number one, you're talking about coming into here and changing this to say 20,000, right? Yes, sir. So you could do that and show them that plan. However, you're not trying to sell based on value anymore. You're selling based on an arbitrary number that they've given you. Okay. So, so how do you deal with that when they're like, if that were to happen or does that not happen and I don't need to worry about it? Well, no, it may happen. Don't get me wrong. It may happen. But if you follow the presentation script pretty closely and you get to the closing question, hey, so which one would you like to go with? The one that's recommended by the VSOs or do you want to try to qualify for the comprehensive plan? At that point, the client should tell you what they either want to do or they'll give you an objection to buying it all. And usually the objection is going to be, well, 304 is going to be a little bit too high. All right. Right. That's the case. What I want you to do is say, hey, that's not a problem. That's exactly why I'm here. What makes sense for you and your family? When I ask that question, I'm really asking them for the budget, right? Right. Okay. If they tell me that the number that they give me, let's say 304 is too high, and they say I can do 200. Now I'm going to build the bronze plan to the $200 because now I have a budget. Okay. Do you want me to show you how to do that? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm here uh, at $5 a day. Well, I'll do $3 because we'll say it's the bronze, right? So I'm at the bronze. Oh, gosh. I'm at the bronze. I've allocated completely. So I'm now right here at 18250 So assume that I'm showing them I'm displaying the plan, mm -hmm. right? The plan has the three across the board, right? In this case, it only shows one, but assume I have three. I'm not showing them the bronze plan yet. It's there as a fallback, but I'm not clicking on it yet. When I ask the question, you know, what makes sense for you and your family, and you tell me $200, what I want you to do is freeze the screen or pause the screen, go back in here and understand that $200 is what you have for a budget. So the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to change this to one higher than what the bronze was. If you follow my instructions, the bronze was double family. So we're gonna to move to triple family. Now I know I've got, i um, using uh, $197, right? Let me make that to three. From before it was 182. I now have three additional dollars I can play. So I can move this up to let's say 114, right? That gets me a $200.60. I made that one change right there. I no longer want to allocate because I don't care about this budget anymore. Right. Right. Okay. About is the budget they gave me. The only reason this exists is to create an artificial budget that I'm then building plans to. Once I get a budget from a client, now I believe I have a buyer. They see the value. They just saying they can't spend 250 bucks or whatever it is I recommended, right? The 304. They can spend yeah. 200. So I tweak it to 200. And now I can show them the benefit, unpause my screen. I can say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I forgot one thing. I'm going to change the name of this plan from bronze to Stephanie. Because I want to personalize it. I want them to think it's their plan, right? When I right. do that, click on this, 
Now it tells me, I mean, it doesn't now because I don't have the other three plans up. But if I did, it would say, Stephanie, I would say, hey, Stephanie, I was able to get done what you asked for. Here's the plan that you wanted at the budget amount that you wanted. Here's the key for everybody. Because I moved the A71 from the double family to triple, I actually increased these numbers down here. The auto accident numbers combined with the any cause of death is what affects that big red number over there. That's the one that you focus on and you go, hey, look, I was able to do this for you. And we still kept the majority of insurance. This is unusual. I'm glad we were able to do that for you. Let's go ahead and get you enrolled because now they saw the value. You gave them the price point that they asked for. There should be no reason why they shouldn't buy. Now, will they not buy sometimes? Yes. But more often than not, they're going to be inclined to actually buy. Now, okay. if they told me, one last thing, if they told me, hey, Julie needs $20,000 of coverage versus Sam, because maybe she's the one working. The way you do that is you come in here, and instead of touching anything else, the only thing that we're going to touch is right here. We're going to change Julie's coverage to $20,000. And then we're going to allocate, and when we allocate, it's going to take it out of Sam's coverage. Okay. Right? And when we do that, instead of allocating both, we're only going to allocate Sam. And that means we're not going to touch Julie's whatsoever. As evidence, when I click allocate, his goes down, hers remains at the 20000 Okay. If I'm working with this client and they tell me that Julie requires $20,000, i am going to ask, okay, then no problem. We can do that for you. There's probably going to be an impact on the amount of coverage for Sam. So we either need to go up a little bit in cost so that we can keep Sam at the same level, or we need to reduce his coverage. What okay. works best for you and your family? And then they're going to okay. tell me, and then I'm going to know. Either I can move up in the cost, or I do it exactly the way I just showed you, which keeps the cost roughly the same. Okay? Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. Joseph, Joseph, what can I do for you? I just have a quick question. Um, so basically, when uh, you're in the middle of a sale, you can go in and out, like depending on um, the prices of the plans and what the customer uh, needs and wants. Like, yeah. let's say they want more coverage, you're going back and you can change it quick. And then they want less, you can change the plans like in the middle of it all. Yeah, I would pause your screen because you don't want them to see this. Can you imagine that if you showed this to a client, what they will start asking you? Yeah. Of course. Now they're going to immediately go, well, what's this A7? What is this? And how does this, what is it? You're going to start getting a lot of questions that you're going to explain that isn't part of your presentation. Yeah. So screen is intended just for the, uh, sorry, the screen is intended only for the agent. So that way you can make the changes that you think are necessary to make. Okay. okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Bridget, what can I do for you? So I've got a couple of questions, but all the numbers that we use to like allocate and for like coverage, are those only numbers from like the customer? Or are those like numbers that we get from you guys? I'm sorry, I do not understand your question. Like the numbers that we input, are those only numbers that we get from the customer or are the numbers that we're entering on the screen set numbers that you like AO would give us what numbers are you referring to the numbers for like coverage you, you're talking about down here yeah so when you first start off the number is in there and when you allocate based on the budget that you put up here the numbers will automatically change is that what you're asking me Kind of. Are they just like, are we getting all that information from the customer or are we getting like the information from like what we've already received when we're creating the plans? Okay, so if you're starting at the beginning and you're creating the plan, the system is putting the numbers in there for you pursuant to what you're putting up here for the analysis approach. Okay. Right now, you, I think Stephanie had me do it, right? You can change that number. And Joseph asked that question too. You can change either the coverage or you can change the amount that they're paying. That's entirely up to you. 
But in the beginning, while we're going through class, so as you're a new agent, you, you want to make sure that you're building the plans in the way that we taught you. So that way it's clean, it's efficient, it doesn't take you that much time, and they're accurate. Okay. Once you get experience, Bridget, you'll find that you're going to jump in here. If I were to sit down and talk with you about insurance now, I would only use two plans and I would ask you questions that tell me how much coverage you actually need. Because I'm no longer worried about having it recommended by the VSO. I'm going to base it on my experience of selling over the years. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then right. how did you get to the other screen that shows like all the coverage benefits basically? From this screen right here? Yeah. Down at the bottom, I click on benefit summary. Okay. And when you're in your script, it tells you exactly what you're supposed to display when you're supposed to display it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Nick, what can I do for you? A uh, quick question. Um, how do you pause your screen? And when you do, what are they, what are they seeing? Okay. So I am sharing my screen right now in my little black bar that goes across my zoom. It says mute, stop video, security, participants, chat, polls, new share. And then right next to that is a little thing called pause screen. When I pause that screen, <clears throat> you're actually seeing the screen that I had showed before. But in fact, I have changed my screen. And now if I reshare it, I actually moved to the screen. And you didn't even see that. So Zoom will take a snapshot of what you were showing at the moment you pause the screen and continue to display that to the client until you unpause your share. Okay. I don't see a uh, pause share. That's because awesome. you're not sharing your screen. Gotcha. Right? I haven't given you the ability to share your screen. Once you share your screen, then the uh, unpause button will be there. Or, I'm sorry, the pause button will be available to you. Understood. Yep. And so all of you are going to be practicing that in a few minutes here, and you can pause your screen. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mark Sales, what can I do for you? Hi, Sam. Uh, could you go back to building the plan? I just want to see... <clears throat> what buttons you push to go from you've established one for the silver first. Um, then I want you, you to uh, be able to do the, the gold next. I didn't see what button uh, you push to uh, create the other one and have it displayed up at the top, like where you're, where you are now. Yeah, no worries. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do it very religiously, right? Rather than sheet, I'm going to say $5 for each one of them. First thing I'm going to do is going to change this to triple family. Then I'm going to allocate the remaining. And when I allocate, I allocate for both. Then I'm going to click finish. That one's set up and ready to go. Now I need to create the other two. So I'm going to take my cursor. I'm going to click on plan options. When I click on plan options, I'm going to change the name of this. In this case, I'll just keep the trip and go silver um, then gold, then bronze, right? And when I do that, I have to hit the check marks. Until I hit the check marks, the only thing that's displayed is the default. The moment I hit these, the all of them are displayed with the appropriate names that I had typed into here, okay? And then I'm gonna take my cursor. Right now I'm showing silver because it's all green. When I click on the gold, I wait for a second so that this all shows blue and now I can make the modifications to blue. Okay, so you're clicking on on the word gold to uh, yes. build the, the next Oh, the plan. tab up here. I mean, if I want to click on bronze, I can click all the way over here. You see how my cursor changed into a, a little finger pointer? So yes. any tab that I click on will change the display to that particular option. Okay, so you just clicked it to the, the bronze. Uh -huh. You were way over there to the right. Yes. Okay, thanks, Sam. Yep, James Solomon, what can I do for you? So I, I think it was Stephanie that pretty much answered all my questions. Um, but here's my, here's, I got another question from what she was asking. So the dollar a day, we can basically change it to basically make it more affordable to the customer, correct? Yeah, you, you mean instead of starting at five, you start at three? Correct, right? Yeah. So you know how she was just asking like, oh, if, or when you answer the question, if their budget is, let's say $200 a month, we can kind of change it around a little bit to where it could be more affordable for the client, correct? Well, 
<laughs> so the short answer is yes, it's correct. However, if a client gives you a budget, then you no longer worry about this artificial budget up here. It doesn't right. matter to you anymore. You want to go in here and make sure that that number right there, the 30417, is at or just below whatever budget amount they gave you. Correct. So okay. then my next question comes from what would, I mean, is there a minimum that AIO wants to stay at so they're profitable as well? Well, okay, so let's walk through the, I mean, I did this yesterday. It's not that there's a minimal amount of profitable at. I can move this to uh, $1,000 and move this or 1,000. That's the minimum policy that you can sell. Okay, you can't sell lower than $1,000. Yes. So you can sell a $1,000 policy and it's only $24.55 a month. Yes. If I multiply that times 12, it's going to give me a number. Will AIL want you to sell it? Of course. Why is that? It's not that they're going to make money off of this. It's that this family will now become a policy owner. And now I have other teams that will then sell into that family who are probably more tenured than you and are going to be able to upsell that family. And I'm looking at it as if I'm the CEO of American Income, right? So I want every single person you talk to to get some type of uh, policy. Now for you, if you're selling, your ALP is $62.51. So on this sale, you spent an hour and a half and you basically got 62 plus 51 is equal to $113 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.75. You earn $42 on this sale. So is it in your interest to build something that small? No, no, it really isn't in your interest, but it, it everything counts, right? Everything matters. What your upline are going to do is say, hey, your average sale should be around $1,500, not around 112 or whatever it was I did here. Oh, yeah. So for every one of you, I say close everything, especially... In the beginning, there are going to be some agents who are very tenured, like, I'm not going to deal with anybody below $1,000. Okay. But for all of you that are starting out, you want to close everything that you can close. You need the experience. We talk about the race to 100. If you haven't heard it, we'll talk about that in the future. It just means 100 presentations you actually have given will allow you to experience all the different challenges that you may encounter with clients and with the system. That means you want to close all of that because you are going to get paid something. Are you going to get paid as much as you want? No, but these type of deals I'm showing you right here are the, are very rare. More often than not, you're going to get people usually anywhere from seven hundred up to two thousand dollars. Does that uh, help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Absolutely, uh, Noah Klein. I'm sorry, Nola. Hi, are you able to hear me? I can't see you, but I oh. can hear. You. Um, oh, go ahead. What's your question? Okay. Sorry. Um, so my question was, and I know you already kind of went over it, um, where it says the dollar a day, is that like a number that we pick for when we're doing different plan options? Like I know they go up and down, like, um, this one would be the recommended since it's like basically in between. And then the essential would be lower than the recommended. And then the comprehensive would be higher. But do we pick that number or is that a number we get from the member? Does that make sense? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it, it, it makes sense completely. Uh, let me look at the veteran presentation script because I want to make sure that my memory is intact. So in this script, when we get to the point, and I'm using veteran uh, simply to make it easy for everybody, but in the veteran script, when we talk about building the plan, it tells you if it's a single person, we want you to do eight, six, and four. And if it's couples, we want you to do five, seven, and three. I do five, eight, and three. Okay. So when you start off, you're going to use those numbers just so you can get familiar. Here's what happens. When you get experienced, when you are talking to somebody in the needs analysis and you ask them, you know, what's your monthly income or how much do you make hourly? And then what's your budget? You're going to look at that and say to yourself, okay, this person is bringing in $10,000 a month and his expenses are 2000 for his family. Let's just say that's the case. 
you probably don't want to start at five. You may want to start higher because they have more of a disposable income, but that's going to be predicated on what you think is going to be sellable or, you know, where that person's not going to feel like you're blowing them out of the water from a budget perspective. In the beginning, though, since you have no experience, we tell you, and the script says specifically that we start in the middle, right, from one to ten dollars a day, and we will start in the middle because that's what most people pick, right? We actually say that in the script. There it is, right there. I'm solidly going to show you what most veterans do in your situation, which is right in the middle of five dollars a day. So if you're following the script religiously, yeah, you're going to start with $5. As you get more experience, you're going to say, hey, we want to do what most veterans do in your situation, which is going to be, let's say, $8 a day right in the middle. You can do that because you're going to build your plans with $8 in the middle and then maybe 12 higher and maybe 7 lower. I don't know. With okay. experience, you'll figure out where you want to go. Okay? Okay. Yep. All right. Awesome. Kelly McDaniel, what can I do for you? Yes, yeah, so I, have, I have a quick question. You what if they tell you like, okay, I can afford $5 a day, but my spouse can only afford $3 a day. Would that be what we would put in the box? The five and three? No, no, because if I'm talking to you, I'm not asking you what you can afford per day. I'm telling you, do you want to go with the recommended plan? With, well, don't look at this one, but the recommended plan at $304.17, or do you want to try to qualify for a higher amount? I'm not asking about dollar per day. What okay. I'm asking is what can you afford a month because that's the money that's going to be taken out of your bank account every month. At that point, you'll tell me, well, I can't really do 300. I can do 250 or no, I can't do that at all. And they don't give you a number. Then you're going to pivot to the bronze. But at that okay. point, you're no longer focused on how much it is a day. You're focused on how much is going to be taken out of their account once a month. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Kaylee Hobbs, what can I do for you? Hey, Sam. So I must have not heard you when I got up to get coffee. Um, my bad. But they're talking about sending you screenshots. Where are we getting these four scenarios from? Because I already understand how to use HP Pro, but like, where am I getting these scenarios to send you the screenshots of four different scenarios? The scenarios. Are you talking about the homework that was due yesterday? I thought we didn't have homework due till Saturday to do the HP Pro. So, uh, yeah, again, I have failed as a facilitator. I promise I will get better, everybody. I promise. It's probably on me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, on page 15 of your handout, it says the HP Pro scenario, scenario one, two, three, and four, all of that is due on day two. Oh. So you would take a screenshot of the scenario and then you would email it to me. And then we're now on Wednesday of week one. My bad. Is there any chance that I can do that like right now and send it to you or is it? cut you know i missed it yeah you can do it right now sense me absolutely okay thank you no, no. and i know i said that ron ronick ronick what can i do for you hey sam um so i was doing the scenarios uh earlier and i noticed that like sometimes like the remaining amount when you allocate the remaining there's like it's a little off maybe like 10 cents or 15 cents is that normal or am i doing something wrong no, that's normal. It's because whatever amount that you're trying to fit in, it doesn't cleanly uh, divide into the number of days in a month. Okay, that's all it is. So if you're a couple cents off, that's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. Is that the last question? I can't believe this. That's so awesome. Okay. So now what we're going to do is, uh, let's see here. Did someone send me this email with the scenarios? Bridget Corgel. Bridget, are you there? Yeah, sorry, my unmute did not work. Um, I had missed the first day and I'm just double checking to see if I have it. Um, I'll let uh, the chat know if I do not have it. All right, somebody can send her uh, directly that day one email with all the attachments and the credit union. That'd be great. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so. Now what we need to do is we need to practice everything that I've gone over. Yes, you've done the homework, but now you actually need to practice building the plans. And the best part of all of this is that you won't be doing it at the plan generator. You're actually going to start right here and you're going to build with the client and you're going to type in other. Okay. 
and you're going to go through all this stuff and you're going to choose the presentation type and you're going to fill out the needs analysis. So you're starting at the beginning and you're actually going to read the script. What I don't want you to do is fill out the information in the family information guide, or if you're in the credit union, fill out the financial information guide. Okay. So what I want you to do is you're going to come in here and you're going to go to, uh, for those of you in veterans, you're going to click on veterans. You're going to click on return card. You're going to type in S G M A D. And then for you in the credit union, you know where you're going to go and what you're going to type in. You're going to select that. The group name will automatically come up and you're going to say, start presentation. When the presentation comes up, I don't want you to worry about actually going through the presentation. What I want you to do is click on needs analysis. And I want you, each one of you, to fill out the needs analysis and someone else is gonna do the role play with you. You're gonna fill out the needs analysis. You're gonna pause your screen and you're gonna build the three plans exactly the way I showed you. $5 for the silver plan, $8 for the gold plan, $3 for the bronze plan, okay? Does anybody have any questions on what you're going to do in these breakout rooms? Yes, Sylvia. Okay, so my situation is I'm just sitting here taking notes because I cannot get into this right now. I've been on the phone with IT for two days about it. So, um, I'm so just... you're, you're going to role play whatever breakout room you're in, okay? You won't have to do it. Okay. I'm yeah, just I'm still in the middle of trying to get it all figured out. Don't so. Worry. I get it. <clears throat> That's exactly why I'm here. We'll work on it. We'll get it done for you. Doris, what's your question? Just to make sure when you say the five, eight, and three dollars a day, you want us to do that if there's a couple per each couple, not total, not like 250 each, right? That's correct. It's five dollars okay. for each person in the couple. And you're gonna your role play will be a couple. So you will have okay, to do perfect. Okay, Mark sales. So sure. Well, my question is uh I'm viewing you on my iPad and I have the, um, the pre-plan up on my laptop. Are we gonna be trying to share because my laptop is not on Zoom, but my iPad is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what you're saying and you're gonna have to share. Okay, so, so it's gonna log into Zoom on your laptop. So I should log into the Zoom on my laptop. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Yep, Joseph, what can I do for you? Um, I've been having the same problem as Sylvia, so I'm gonna have to role play. You can be a participant and do the role play, okay? Thank you. Heather Michaels, what can I do for you? Uh, same thing, I am unable to get into HP Pro, um, so I probably okay. need to be put with the others. And the Well, you're room. all gonna be put into automatic rooms, whatever room you're in, just go ahead and uh, tell them that you can't present because you can't log into HP Pro. Okay. Kelly McDaniel, do you have the same issue? No, I, I was just clarifying with the recommended plan. It's going to be triple. The $8 plan will be quintuple. And then the bronze plan will be double, correct? Yes. Okay. Nick, what can I do for you? You just answered my question. I love it when a plan comes together. Uh, Gabe, what can I do for you? Uh, I just wanted to say I'm in the same situation as the, um, I can't get into HP Pro right now. So all of you that can't get into HP Pro, buy some you, excuse me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought I was muted. <laughs> for excited. all of you in H who have problems getting into HP Pro, uh, have you checked with your upline? And you don't have to answer, I'm assuming that you did. Can you have your upline <clears throat> provide you their login so that you can get into it? That to me is the easiest way to solve the problem. And if you can do that, that would be great. Do I have any other questions from anybody? Okay, I'm gonna create breakout rooms now. Wait, I'm so sorry. <laughs> What was the name you put in the client name? I didn't see that part. So we can get in to the needs analysis. Other. Other, thank you. Yeah, type other. If you don't, and, and there's a reason for that, I'll show you guys the reason for that later. But yeah, you type in other, it'll have a drop down, then you select it. 
Stephanie, do you have a question or can I put everybody in the breakout rooms? We do the presentation starting at B2, correct? Uh, are you talking about the veteran presentation? Yes, because well, we're doing the needs analysis. So when we role play, we start at B2. Yep, we're starting right there. Show, uh, gosh, hold on. Share my screen. I guess that would help. So in the veteran presentation, you're uh, transition to the needs analysis. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is actually start at B3. I don't need you to read that because I okay. need to read. But the B3 is important because that's where you're going to start asking the health questions. And then mm -hmm. you have to pause after that. So this is your first time actually having to do this in a script scenario but I'm not having you do the entire script. I just want you to focus on B3 all the way through the closing question. If everybody understands what I'm saying, you need to get to all the way down here, right there, if you're in the veteran script. That is the closing question you need to get to. I'm opening okay. up 30 breakout rooms. That means there's three people per room. Last thing I will ask or tell you is if anybody has any questions or needs me to answer a question or whatever, I can't be in every break room, obviously, but you can request help. So in the bottom of the screen where you would say, raise your hand to ask a question, you're not going to ask a question. You're going to now request my help or you're going to ask me something. And what that does is tells me that you need me to come to your room. <clears throat> Give me a minute because I'm probably going to be helping other people, but I will eventually get to your room and we'll take care of whatever your issues are. Okay. Everybody tracking with me right now. Okay. That is awesome. All the rooms are now open. Please join the rooms and start practicing your script. <laughs> back I'm glad we're back hey so just so everyone knows i'm listening to what you guys are talking about yeah i have you memorized a1 because i want you to build rapport and have a conversation and uh when you're done with that then you're going to say i'm going to share my screen with you the first thing you do is turn your camera off right because i know that not everybody's going to be smooth with the dialogue now remember in the old days we had to actually memorize the entire script whether it was this script, whether it was another script, and that can be daunting. But you have to remember, in those days, everybody had to be in an office, in the same office. And you would sit there in that office, uh, looking at each other, repeating the script over and over and over again. The beauty is, you don't have to be in an office with people anymore. Right? Much more flexible. The downside is now, you have to learn how to do that script on your own. Once you do this so many times, you'll pretty much know the script inside and out and you'll know where to navigate but in the beginning it's a little tough since i don't want you to memorize it i want the cameras off and then this way the client is not looking at you like why are you not looking at me the entire time right what's going on okay so i brought everybody back from the breakout rooms because now we're going to go over the phone scripts so i start the course with an introduction then i go right into hp pro the main tool that you use and the very most difficult, the very the most difficult part of the tool is building options, right? Now you all should hopefully start tonight be making phone calls for your uplines. Hopefully, we'll see if that happens. So what I want to do is go over the phone scripts that all of you have. <clears throat> so for the veterans, the phone scripts were, <clears throat> pardon me, the phone scripts were attached to the day one email, okay, and they're called veteran phone scripts. For the credit union, I sent this out to everybody like five minutes ago. Those are the phone scripts for the credit union market. Now, the reason that I don't spend a whole lot of time on these phone scripts is for two points. Number one, you're on a phone, which means you don't need to look at anything. You don't need to memorize anything. You just need to read what it says. Okay, complete control. You don't have to present information. You don't have to come up with a whole bunch of stuff. You just actually have to read what's on that script. And it's very similar the way that we've designed it. You may see scripts from your upline. You may go on to uh, Planet Altig and see all these scripts with all these words that talk about how to call somebody who's a referral versus an internet lead versus a response card lead. Okay, at AOM International, we make it really simple. One page. And we go through the process 
and show you what that looks like so that you can be successful. So all that being the case, I am going to go with the veteran presentation, uh, sorry, not the presentation, oh my gosh, the veteran phone script. And the first one that uh, we are going to do is, you know, I love it when uh, the computer just does not want to cooperate whatsoever. Okay, the first one we're going to do is what's called RC Vet Phone Script. Okay, we throw that up on the screen. It's very straightforward. I'll share it and we can go through it. So basically, I am going to use Sandra Taylor as my role play. Sandra, here we go. Ring, ring, ring. I can't. There we go. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Sandra. Is this Sandra? This is she. Hi, Sandra. My name is Sam Sweet. I'm actually a director with the Veteran Division of American Income. We're working in cooperation with the VFW of the state of California. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. And you? Great. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Hey, I'm giving you a call because recently you received a letter about your group death benefit and you filled out a three by five card naming John, your husband, as your beneficiary. Do you remember filling out that card? I think so. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So the reason I'm calling is that your benefits have been processed and it's actually my job to issue your burial guide and most importantly, explain the VA burial benefits that you and your family are entitled to receive. So are you currently working or are you retired? I'm retired. Oh, hey, that's great. I, hopefully I can get there at some point. Are both you and John at home right now? Uh, no, John's at work. Okay, no worries. So for your safety and convenience, they're issuing your benefits over a short Zoom call. Looks like I can take care of this for you tonight at 7 or at 8.30. Which time works for best for you and John? I would probably say the 8.30. 8.30? Okay, great. Now, the only thing they're asking of you as a veteran is make sure that 8.30 actually works for both you and John, because if you take that spot, it actually takes it away from another veteran. So just to confirm, 8.30 works for you? Yes, that'll work. Okay. And do you receive text messages on the phone number I'm calling you on? I do. Great. What I'm going to do is send you a confirmation text with the Zoom meeting invitation. And then uh, are you familiar with Zoom or do you want me to give you a call a few minutes ahead of the appointment so I can help you through it? Uh, I might need some assistance. Yes. Sure, I'll give you a call and we'll go for that. I have you scheduled today at 8.30. Let's make sure John's there because the benefits do apply to him as well. So you have a great evening, okay? Thank you, you as well. Okay, so that went pretty smoothly, pretty easily, right? It's one page. All you're doing is following this. If it's the answer is no, when you do you remember filling out the card, then you talk about this. Because what you're going to do is then confirm the information that you have is appropriate for the person that you're speaking with. If the answer is yes, you skip that and you go to the reason I'm calling you is. If the answer is no, you go here and then you go here. Everyone tracking with me? Okay. If the uh, person you're talking to and their spouse is available, then we say, hey, go ahead and grab your spouse, put them on the speakerphone. We'll knock this out really quick. And then you're going to move to a Zoom presentation. That's the best scenario. That's why it's highlighted in blue. Because an on-the-spot presentation is where we ultimately want to get to if we can. If we can't, then we want to set an appointment. If you notice in the appointment setting, I don't say, hey, when are you available? Right? I don't, I don't do that. What I say is, hey, it looks like I can take care of this for you today online at one time or another. I want to stay in control of the phone call. And I also want to project the fact that I'm busy. I got things going on. I want to set a calendar event with you for today, preferably. So the best case scenario is on the spot. Next best case is sometime later today. The third case is sometime tomorrow. Anything beyond tomorrow, you're going to schedule a callback because if it's beyond tomorrow, the likelihood that they don't show up, it goes up. It gets very high. If people are busy, they're doing whatever, they're like, oh yeah, sure, set me up for Friday. Friday comes, you expect them to be on a Zoom call, they don't show up. We're all busy. We have things that pop up. But if I can get somebody scheduled for later this evening, they're more than likely going to show up. So that's what the script looks like for a response card. That means that somebody belongs to one of the VSOs and they actually submitted the three by five card. Hopefully all of you remember that from Andrew Haskins talking about that. Does that ring a bell to everybody? 
Okay. So if that rings a bell, that's great. That's the response card. The other one is Pavit in the uh, veteran market. And the Pavit is basically the internet. Somebody's either on uh, Facebook or they're on uh, one of the other uh, social networking sites. And they request information and sign up with their um, email address and name. And they're a veteran saying, I want to get information. So they can either do it on behalf of a veteran or they're doing it on behalf of themselves, right? So Doris Stokes, we're going to role play. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey, Doris. Is this Doris? Yes, this is. Hi, Doris. My name is Samuel Sweet. I'm a director with the Veterans Vision of American Income, working in cooperation with the local veteran service organizations. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for asking. And calling you regarding the burial kit. And I'm sorry, the burial guide and will kit for veterans that you requested in November of last year using the security keyword of frog. Do you remember filling out that request? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, that's awesome. Hey, so the reason I'm calling you is that your benefits have been processed and it's my job to issue your burial guide, but most importantly, explain the very VA burial benefits that you and your family are entitled to receive. So then the rest of it is exactly the same. Right, everything below that is exactly the same as the previous one. The only difference is, is that she submitted a request for information. She is typically not going to be a member of the VSOs. She just wanted information. Now she might be, but that's not where the lead came from. The lead came from uh, the internet as opposed to the response card. Okay, now let's go to Kaylee Hobbs. Kaylee, I'm calling you. You're a referral. Here we go. Ring, ring. I ring, think ring, put ring. In the chat that she had to put her son on the bus and she'd be right back. Oh, no worries. Nick, you're going to be my referral. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Hey, is this Rick? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading this wrong. Is this Nick? Yes. Yes. <laughs> hey, this Nick. Is Nick, not Rick. <laughs> awesome. Nick, you're the, probably the right person I want to get a hold of. Hey, my name is Samuel Sweet. I'm actually a director with the Veterans Division of American Income. Now, I had the pleasure of sitting down with your brother, John, the other day about their veteran benefits. Okay. Now, I'm, call, I'm calling you regarding the barrel guide and will kit for veterans and their families that John extended to you. Did he tell you I'd be calling? He did. He did. Yeah. He uh, uh, was pretty excited about it. Oh, awesome. That's great to hear. So the reason I'm calling you is to set up a time to be able to go over all of those benefits with you and let you know what you're entitled to receive. Now, the benefits do cover both you and a spouse. Do you have a spouse or a significant other? I do. Uh, her name's Nancy. Nancy. Okay. And are you currently working or are you retired? Uh, I work. Okay. Are you at work right now or are you at home? Well, I work out of my home, but I'm working right now. Uh, oh, okay. Gotcha. So then you can see everybody. I'm not going to go into a Zoom presentation on the spot because he says he's working. And remember, this market's protected. We don't want to be that aggressive. So then you go, hey, for your safety and convenience, there's your benefits over a short Zoom call, exactly like we did before. Okay. This is very easy to do. We have people all the time that are making phone calls on our behalf. You don't need to be a licensed agent because you're not actually doing a presentation. All you're doing is finding a time to set up uh, the appointment. Now, you're probably going to be setting up the appointment for one of your uplines or somebody in your hierarchy because you don't have your own lead packs, right? So you may have to tweak this a little bit to reflect the fact that I'm calling on behalf of, let's say, Samuel Sweet, okay? You can go down that path and do it. Now, if you're in a credit union, and remember, we're doing this for both of you, so you all can be uh, uh, cognizant. Who's a credit union member in here? I'm sorry, who's working in the credit union market? All right, Dave, here we go. Ring, ring. Hello? Hey, Dave? Yes. Hey, Dave, my name is Samuel Sweet. I'm actually a director with the Credit Union Division of American Income, working in cooperation with the Seattle City Credit Union. How are you doing today? Doing all right. How are you? Great. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Hey, I'm calling you because you recently received a letter about your group death benefit, and you filled out a three-by-five card naming Jill, your wife, as your beneficiary. Do you remember filling out that card? I do not remember that. Okay, no problem. Let me just confirm the information that you wrote down. You wrote your address as 123456. Uh, yep. That's awesome. It. That's great. You also wrote down your date of birth as 32461. That's it. 
All right, awesome. I want to make sure I'm talking to the right person. Now, the reason I'm calling you is that your benefits have been processed, and it's my job to review the services and benefits you receive from the credit union, review the life insurance they've set up for the members, and establish your wife as your beneficiary. Are you currently working or retired? I am currently working. Okay, so then we go down the same path as everything else, right? Everything's exactly the same. We condense the scripts that you may find on Planet Altig or someone else may give it to you to one page. And the reason we did that is because all the additional information you could possibly talk about makes no difference in setting an appointment. If you've done your job up here and you establish your credibility about why you're calling, and if they say, no, I don't remember doing that, and you give them their information, now they're going to believe that you actually know who they are and why you're calling. And so now you're just going to move right into a presentation, okay? If you're the union internet phone script, this is a little bit different. Sade, you're going to be my role play. Here we go. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey, is this Sade? Yes, who's this? Hey, Sade. My name is Samuel Sweet. I'm actually a director of the Credit Union Division of American Income. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Hey, I'm calling regarding the credit union benefits you requested in November using the security keyword of Blossom. Do you remember filling out that request? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, no problem. I'll back up and fill you in on what's going on. Members across the state of California have been requesting information regarding their benefits, and credit unions in your area want to ensure all members know what they're entitled to receive. The reason I'm calling is that your benefits have been processed and it's my job to review and explain the services and permanent benefits available to credit union members. Now, your benefits cover both you and a spouse. Do you have a spouse or significant other? Uh, no, I do not. No? Okay, no worries. And then we go right into the rest of it. Exactly the same. Are you currently working or are you retired? Right? We make it very, very simple in order to get through this. All right? Renee Zimmerman. Are you doing the last phone script with me? Ring, ring. Ring, Hello. ring. Hello. Yeah, hi, Renee. Hi. Hi, Renee. My name is Samuel Sweet. I'm actually a director with the credit division of, of um, the credit division, the credit union division of American Income. Wow, if I say credit division, somebody can be like, oh, you're a bill collector? Credit union division of American Income. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for asking me. Hey, I'm giving you a call regarding the credit union benefits that John extended to you. Do you uh, did he tell you I'd be calling? Yes, he did. Okay, awesome. So the reason I'm calling you is I set up a time to review those benefits with you and let you know what you're entitled to receive. And then the rest of it is going to be exactly the same. Do you have a spouse? What's their name? Are you currently working, retired, or are you at home? Right? If she had said no, then I'm going to say, oh, they didn't. Well, I'm going to have to give them a call. They were supposed to let you know. That's okay, though, because I'm going to back up and fill you in what's going on. Members across the state of Oregon have been requesting information regarding the benefits and credit unions in your area, want to ensure all members know what they are entitled to receive. The Seattle City Credit Union allow them to extend those to their closest friends and family, and John chose you to receive them. You should definitely thank him because those because these are typically exclusive to credit union members. So what we're doing on a referral basis, we're saying, hey, we've extended these to you, or the credit union is extending these to you because they're authorizing John to do it. So if she doesn't remember John or John never reached out to her or didn't get the text or whatever, you're now building the credibility on why you're having this conversation. And she's going to get those benefits that she's entitled to receive. Is everybody tracking now? We went through all three for both markets. Yes, Tara. Um, just when we're starting out making these calls to make appointments for our upline, what if they are immediately available with their spouse and they want to get started on it right away? Oh, so when you get ready to make a phone call with your upline, which may be tonight, if not, it'll definitely be tomorrow. Uh, the upline will tell you what times they're available for a meeting. Okay. So they'll tell you before you start making calls. They're like, hey, I am available. So if you get a hold of somebody, we can move to an on-the-spot appointment. Hey, I'm not available. I got stuff going on, but I have times available today at 637, 730, and 8. Okay. And then tomorrow at X. So you'll have, you'll know what that schedule is so that you're not in the dark blindly trying to figure out when somebody's going to book an appointment. I understand. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. 
So we went through all of those phone scripts. I'm sorry, Kayla Howell, bring it. So um, are we just assuming that if they want to go, I mean, not like once we're doing it on our own, if they want to go right into Zoom, are we just assuming they have Zoom or are we like somehow transitioning to Zoom? Because we're just on a regular phone call at this point, right? Yeah, so you're here, right? And you're yeah. saying, we're going to put me on, Zoom, on the speakerphone, we'll knock this out. And if they do that, then you're going to say, okay, we do these presentations on Zoom. Do you have a computer or do you have a smartphone? And they'll go, uh, I have a computer. Okay, no problem. Open up your internet browser and I'm going to send you my personal meeting ID or I'm going to send you whatever so that exactly. you can log right into Zoom and then okay. you're going to transition that way. So you'll the transition reason, to it. Okay. Yeah. The reason I don't put it in the script formally is because I don't know how you're going to get them there. Right. It's entirely up to you. Right. Okay. If you're calling on behalf of somebody else, then you're going to have to get that information from your upline. If you're doing it for yourself, you know exactly how you want them to get there. Right. Okay. Got it. James Solomon, bring it. Uh, so this is off this topic. When we're um, in our uh, in our own little uh, groups, a uh, question came up. What if someone, someone vapes? It's not technically tobacco. It's not something like that. How would you respond to that? Like, is it tobacco or is it not tobacco? Thank you. I would ask the question. Of, my understanding is tobacco, uh, I'm sorry, vapes have tobacco, but I'm not going to assume that. I, that's just my understanding. I'm going to ask them, does it have tobacco? Yes or no? <laughs> If they say yes, then they're a tobacco user. If they say no, then I'm not going to put it down, right? Because it's what they're claiming. I don't know the answer. So I'm going to base the response in the application on what they told me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, what do you got for me? So if you can't get them to commit to Zoom, would you be able to like get this done over FaceTime? Yes. Zoom is not the end all. It's just a convenient way for you guys, for all of us to be able to talk to folks. I've used Google Meeting. I've used FaceTime. I, I used, uh, I don't know, a couple other ones. It doesn't matter to the business which one you use because it's not being recorded. You're not saving this for anything. Okay. What is important is that you actually see the client. So, so even if I, I never get on a Zoom call, I can just do everything through FaceTime. It never matters yes. getting on Zoom, right? That's correct. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. And James, I already answered your question. Vanessa Abo, what can I do for you? Hi. So two questions that came up in our um, breakout room. Um, you know, when you're quoting them and it says, like, you're going over the benefits, you're explaining it. Um, on the script, when it said daily hospital benefit, where do we say, like, what, like, what is the weekly amount? We're kind of confused about that. You multiply the amount you get every day by seven. Okay, that's what we figured. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah, right. Okay, perfect. And then the intensive care, um, that's when, like, it didn't doesn't say, like, when you say the amount, it just says you and blank. So I was kind of confused. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Uh -oh. That's where you put the spouse's name, like, if it's a oh, married yeah. couple. Well, yeah, and, yeah, but if you don't have a spouse, like, where do you say? Like, well, I'm showing sure you my screen, right? This is what you're talking about right here? Yeah. Okay, so if you don't have a family, I would say these benefits will cover you for the rest of your life starting today. No, I get that. I'm saying, like, where do you say the amount that you that they get? Because, like, usually the blank is the amount, right? No, like, in this case, the blank is going to be if you have a family. The amount says they'll double that amount for a full two weeks. So if okay. it's 100 and they're going to double it, it'll be for $200 a night for up to 14 days. Okay, so you say like they'll double the 200 for... Yes, whatever you had originally selected. Uh -huh. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly why I'm here. Kaylee Hobbs, what can I do for you? Okay, so um, the vape question, and they say it's not tobacco. Would that make them qualify for a trial like we wouldn't want to sign them up no. for okay no, you're going to and we would just note that you won't even have to note it i mean to me if you vape then typically there's going to be some tobacco in it but if you tell me because i'm going to ask a question is there do you yeah. use tobacco in any form well i vape well is there tobacco in the vape no there's not okay then you're not a tobacco user okay and we'll just take right. it at that okay and then there's also the facetime question so I talked to my upline about this and he said he has no idea about Google Meet, FaceTime, any of that. 
how would we do the presentation? Because it requires like turning off the screen and reading the script and pausing and <laughs> how do we exactly. show them that with being on FaceTime? So I have done it in the past myself where I take my little phone and I'm talking to them. Can you guys see me here? Let me turn this off here. So on FaceTime, I'm talking. There I am. I'm talking to them just like this, right? Blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Blah, 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 blah. And now I'm going to show you my screen since we can't do it via Zoom. And I'm going to take my phone and I'm going to bring it up there. Whoops, up there so the camera can see the phone. And then anytime I don't want them to see the screen, I bring it back to me. Now, kind of makes it easy. Okay. This place that sits on my desk. So I don't have to hold the phone. I can just do that, right? So it sits on my desk and then I just turn it around and show the screen. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Who's next? Bridget Corgel, bring it. So what if they do not have like access to like a smartphone or a computer? How are you supposed to like present then? Uh, how are you supposed to present? So let's take that a question as if you're making the phone calls, right? And in the process of making the phone calls, the objection is, hey, uh, I don't have a computer, right? So let's yeah. look at that. So in your day one email, you should have a, a handout or an attachment that says phone vet phone script rebuttals. These script rebuttals are the same things for the credit union. Okay, there's no difference. It's called veteran because that was the market that these were created for. So to answer your question, if it's, hey, can you just mail it to me? Sure, any physical forms you need would be mailed to you. My job is just to find a time for the representative or for myself to walk you through the benefits over Zoom first, just to answer any questions you and your spouse have. I already know my benefits. That's great. This will actually make it go quicker. Uh, this is just to get everything set up for you that you as a veteran are entitled to. And if you're in the credit union market, then it's everything set up for you that you as a credit union member or credit union referral uh, are entitled to. I don't want to buy anything, I already have insurance. Okay, I understand. Remember these benefits uh, you already have. My job is to find time for your benefit delivery, right? Because no matter what market, they're getting no cost benefits. I don't have the time right now. Okay, give me 30 seconds. Let me tell you what I'm doing. Let's set up a time and talk later. I usually say, well, I'm not actually going to do it right now. I'm only going to take 30 seconds to set up a time so we can do the Zoom. I don't want to do it with you right now, okay? I don't have internet. So this is to your question, right, Bridget? Okay, yep. do you have a cell phone? Do you have a nearby relative or a friend with internet access? You're trying to find a way to have that conversation because you can't actually present something to somebody using only the phone. Let me rephrase that. You could do it, but you're not encouraged, right? We want 99% of people to actually see everything on a screen that you're going to present them because it then means it has value. It's tangible. If I do the whole thing over the phone, it's very difficult to get people to understand that they're getting $100,000 in coverage and it's broken out between, you know, the freedom of choice, accidental death, all that other stuff, right? Yeah. So we need to move them to that. So that's the way to overcome the internet objection is to ask if they have a nearby friend or relative with internet access. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then I don't remember requesting anything. What's this all about? Oh, okay, let me fill you in. Blah, 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 blah. Obviously, this was focused on veterans, but you can say this is, like I had mentioned, credit unions in your area had set up uh, the information to get out to you about all the benefits you're entitled to receive. I don't want to do this. Hey, that's not a problem. Then we say, just to confirm, you don't want a representative to explain all the benefits to which you're entitled to uh, receive that you already have. So we're just reconfirming that they don't want to do this. Because there are people who would say, no, I don't want to do it. Even if they submitted a request for the information, sometimes people are like, hey, I just expected to get an email or something in my uh, mailbox. I didn't expect somebody to call me. If that happens, that's okay. You're not trying to sell me anything, are you? Oh, then we say your representative will go everything with you that you're entitled or that you're covered for and entitled to receive. My job right now is just to find a time for the benefit delivery. So you're not actually saying yes, you're not actually saying no. And then does my spouse have to be there? We all want the spouses there because the majority of the time, if the spouse is not there, they don't make a buying decision. They usually defer to the spouse. So you want them both together so that you can ask the buying question and hopefully overcome any objections. So in the credit union space or the veteran space, you can continue to use the phone rebuttals as I've just showed them here to you when trying to set an appointment. Yes, Nico, what can I do for you? 
Hey, Sam, I just want to touch on that tobacco user question. Uh, it's actually any kind of nicotine product. Uh, so if the doctor knows that they vape or use any kind of nicotine product and uh, they get the medical records and see that, it's going to be a deal breaker. Uh, it could potentially ruin the relationship between the company and the member. Well, it will, are you asking me that or are you telling me that? No, I just wanted to touch base and let them know that if, if they use a vape, any kind of product that has nicotine in it, that they're considered a tobacco user. Uh, I used to run in-person sales for AIL, and uh, we have to, we used to have to use oral swabs for any non-tobacco user. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're correct. Now, will it, will it damage the relationship? What ends up happening is if, in fact, you say you're a non-tobacco user, we don't take the oral swab anymore, but if everything else is okay, it'll go back to underwriting and then underwriting will pull all the information from the medical information board everywhere else, right? If we determine that you're a smoker, what we will do is we will then rate you, okay? We'll rate the client and then we'll send a mod to you so you can call the client and go, by the way, in the process of doing underwriting, we've determined that you smoke. And then we just have to confirm at that point, did you quit smoking? And if you did, was it over a year ago? If it was over a year ago, there's another form that we fill out and they're okay. If it's under a year or there's continuing to vape or chew tobacco or whatever, then they're going to have to pay the rates that have been modified. Now, they can either keep the amount of insurance that they wanted and pay a higher rate or keep the rate the same, but the insurance amount goes down. So yeah, there, it, there's a lot of moving parts there. But for the most part, if somebody tells you that they vape, I always... Most of the time, vape has tobacco products in it, just so everybody knows. But sometimes people are going to argue and go, no, there's nothing in my vape. Okay, if you're telling me there's no tobacco in it, I'm going to say you're a non-tobacco user. Just keep in mind, if there's any history that you've used tobacco, it will come out during the underwriting process. So you're right on, Nico. Thank you. Joseph, what can I do for you? Um, I had a question about the on-the-spot on um, for the yes. uh, phone script. So like, let's uh, say if someone's dialing for you, or you're yeah. dialing for somebody, they say, um, you say, go ahead and grab your spouse and put me on speakerphone. We can knock this out right now. Uh -huh. What happens then? Like, what would you do? If somebody's dialing for me or I'm calling for myself? Like, let's say someone's dialing, I'm dialing for you. Oh, okay. I would so call I've had you. Before, and what I do before I even give them any list to call or anything, I walk them through. Here's what I want you to do. So today I'm available at one o'clock on. Okay. If I get an appointment, I will let you know so that you know not to book me. If I have no appointments, you can book me on, on the spot. The moment I get an appointment, they will then know I'm in an appointment and won't be available until, let's say, 3 o'clock, right? So they're constantly knowing my schedule. Now, for me, um, I, I don't have the quick fix, the quick fix but I... Hello? Yeah, uh, sorry. For, for me, my phone setters have my Calendly which will look at all the different calendars that I have and they know that when I'm available versus when I'm not. Does that make sense? So I don't not, need yeah. to do all that work ahead of time. So the moment they're starting to make calls for me, they know when I'm going to be available. Okay. I got yeah. you. Thank you. Zuri Reed, what can I do for you? Hey, on the uh, debt phone script rebuttals, uh, yes. would the question or statement um that uh, you know or i guess question is is this a uh, spam call type thing would you answer in the same way that i don't want to do this no because okay. if they're asking if is, is it a spam call or they're saying are you marketing or are you just, like no actually depending upon the call um sorry depending upon the lead type so whether it's veteran market or credit market doesn't matter there's two types there's three types right it's either a referral or they're asking for information through an internet lead, or they're a member of uh, a VSO or a member of a credit union, and they've requested the uh, accidental death and dismemberment benefit, right? So I'm not just calling arbitrarily like a telemarketer. I'm calling because you asked for me or you were referred to me by somebody you know to receive these benefits. Okay. Right? So How if somebody's in the the answer is no. I'm sorry, okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you for that answer. How often does that come up, like statistically? Like, is there a percentage that someone asks that 
after all your if somebody asks that no that the number of people who ask that would be less than the number of people who say no i'm not interested at all <laughs> okay, good right so though some will be like why are you calling me well, most times people won't pick up the phone to be honest with you right they just won't answer if it's a number they don't recognize they're not going to answer so most of your uplines don't want you to leave voicemails which is why i don't put it into the script because all you're doing is you're making calls constantly, constantly to get somebody on the phone and then try to set an appointment. Now there is, you can leave voicemails if you want, when you have your own book of business, if that's what you want to do, you can certainly do that. But most people uh, do not pick up phone numbers they don't recognize unless that number shows up a lot. So with my phone setters and myself, I probably call the same number in my lead pack five, six times in a day, easily. And if somebody gets on the phone and be like, hey, why the heck do you keep calling me? Like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to get a hold of you. I'm really glad that we we're able to connect. Is everything okay? And then you're gonna be like, yeah, everything's okay. Why are you calling me? And then I go right into my phone script. Okay. So you don't suggest like text or anything? Oh yeah, I definitely suggest oh, okay. text. But for you right now, texting on behalf of your uh, upline doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the text is coming from you, not from them. Okay. All right, okay, Nick, cool. what do I do for you? So, um, if they if they say that they're a smoker in our needs analysis, um, you know, we we have that in there. You know, we ask yeah. them back a user would the would the program not rate them automatically as a smoker and basic, you know, the initial um, in the initial presentation and give the rates for a smoker as opposed to a non-smoker? If you put tobacco user in the needs analysis, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, plan generator where it says TU next to their name, if you yes. put that in there, it'll rate, it'll increase the cost automatically. Okay, but, and we okay. still have, and then we're, we're still gonna need to ask questions. Uh, yeah, which is yeah, because that's just a basic understanding of where you're at. You don't even get to the medical questions until after the needs analysis is done and they want to buy. Because remember, right. we're going to give and take away. Hey, it looks like, uh, you know, we got all the stuff. I know you want it. However, you still need to qualify. And the way you qualify is with all the medical and health and habit questions. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions for everybody? Everybody knows this phone script. Let me rephrase that. Everybody's comfortable with the one-page script depending upon what market you're in and depending upon which type of lead you have. Is that a correct statement? Mary Frederick, I'm going to go to you. Role play. Let's go. Veteran. Referral. I am the client. Call me. All right. Ring, ring. Hello. Hi, Sam. Who is this? Sam, hi. My name is Mary. I'm with the Veteran Division of American Income. How are you? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Why are you calling me? Oh, you would do that to me. <laughs> um, sorry. Oh, Mary, Mary. Yeah. And, uh, I'm calling in regarding to your burial guide and will kit for veterans and their families that John, your brother, extended up to you. Did he or she tell you that I'd be calling? Did who tell you? John, your brother. My bro yeah, I know John. I haven't talked to him in years, so I don't know. If he has something to do with this, I don't want anything to do with it. Okay, I understand. But these are benefits that you may already have. My job is just to find out a good time for your benefit delivery. Mary? Mary, 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 Mary. So up on my screen, I'm looking at the script and maybe it's just me, I'm a little confused. And that happens, okay, that happens. But if I push back at you at any point in here, you're, well, I believe you're gonna go into here, right? Yeah, Is I can't right? go in there. Okay, and then you say, hey, they were supposed to let you know, that's okay, I wanna back up and fill you in on what's going on. Because if I did, if I'm pushing back and saying, I didn't talk to this guy, whoever referred me, hey, I'm gonna give you what's going on. And I gotta do that in this part of the script. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so uh, Doris Stokes, Credit Union, internet. 
Help me. Okay, hang on. Pulling it up. Hello. I was, I was ready for vet. Hang Hello, on. who is this? Hi, this is Hello. Doris. <laughs> Hang on, Doris? I have to pull it up. He's screen sharing know. for you. Oh, it's he's screen sharing. Oh. Yeah, if you want to do, I mean, it's up to you. Dude. Okay, you do I'm back. I'm back. Hi, okay, Sam. Hi, Sam. Who is this? Hi, Sam. My name is Doris Stokes. I'm with the Credit Union Division of American Income. How are you today? You know, it's a really bad day. I don't have time for this. Can you call me back later? Sorry to hear that. I promise you I'll just take a few quick minutes of your time. I'm just calling regarding the credit union benefits you requested in December using the security word dog. Do you remember filling out that request? No, that sounds like something my wife would have done. I do not like that dog. It has fleas. I would never use it. What did you say? A security keyword? I don't even know what this is all about. Can you call no. me back later? Yeah, no problem. I'll back up and fill you in on what's going on. Members across the state of Ohio have been requesting information regarding their benefits and credit unions in your area. I want to ensure all members know what they're entitled I'm to. I'm not a member of a credit union, so you probably are calling the wrong person. Um, now, well, the reason I'm calling is because that your benefits have been processed. Um, I know you said maybe I'm your spouse. I'm not a member of a credit union. Okay, I know you said your spouse is a, a member of the credit union, possibly. Oh, I didn't say that. Well, is she there with you? Doris, are you making this up as you go? Yes. <laughs> all right, Doris, it's okay. People, <laughs> all of us here, we're going to get people who are very nice on the phone. Okay, it is going to happen, right? If I'm telling Doris, hey, I don't know what this is all about. And she goes, you know what? Maybe your spouse had submitted that. Yeah. Okay. Maybe your spouse has submitted that, but let me tell you what's going on and be very nice and move into it. Now, you just didn't acknowledge the fact that I told you I don't have time for this, right? Which is okay. It's not the end of the world because you want to keep going. You want to get to the point where you actually are able to book an appointment. Does that make sense to everybody? So Doris, yes. you did pretty much appreciate that. Let's go to Elizabeth Pulaski. Elizabeth, you're in the credit union space and you are a response card. I am the client. Go. Hello? Is this thing working? Sorry. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Can you not hear me? I can I can hear you. We hear you, not Sam, Sam now. Sam, okay. <laughs> we can't hear you. You probably knocked something over or something like that. Don't put me on the spot like that and then not hear me. <laughs> He's like, is this thing working? And then it broke. <laughs> hey, Sam. You're gone, Sam. I think he hung up on you. I think he had to log out and log back in. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so lucky. I wish he broke on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that lucky because I'm a dialer for a whole, nother, a whole nother thing. So like, this is not, I don't like this. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So Elizabeth, uh, that person hung up on you. So you want to try again? Uh, no, but yeah, sure. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hello. Hi, Sam. My name's Elizabeth. How are you? I'm good. What good. I'm with the I'm with the Credit Union Division of American Income, and I'm working in cooperation with the Seattle Credit Union. Yeah, I don't need to belong to a credit union, but thank you for calling. I don't have the rebuttals for the credit union one. It's the <laughs> on the screen. So here's the thing, right? I may give you. It's an not really on the screen, though. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. I may not give you an objection that's in this list. Okay. Okay. You got to know how to roll with it. So what did I say? I'm not interested in joining a credit union, right? Yeah. So then. All right. Let's reverse it. Let's reverse it. Okay. Because I know I've now freaked you out completely. Ring, yeah. ring, <laughs> ring, 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 ring. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Is this Elizabeth? It is. Hi, Elizabeth. My name is Sam. I'm actually a director with the Credit Union Division of American Income. We actually work in cooperation with the Seattle City Credit Union. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm actually not interested in joining credit union, though. 
that's totally fine because that's not why I'm giving you a call. Actually, I'm calling you because recently you received a letter about your group death benefit and you filled out a three by five card naming John, your husband, as your beneficiary. Do you remember filling out that card? No, I don't. Okay, no problem. Let me just confirm the information that I have. You wrote down your address as 438 Pocatello Drive. Is that correct? Yes. And your date of birth is uh, 224-1920. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't read this. It says 1980. My bad. Is 1980 the correct year? Yeah. All right. See how that is? You, so yeah. What if she said no to that? What would you do then? Nope, that's oh, not the perfect. correct name. No, awesome. no date of birth address. Very good question. In your mobile planet, you can actually text them a copy of the response card that they, or the return card that they filled out. So sometimes I'll have people tell me, hey, I never did that. And then I send it to them and I call, I say, I'll call you back in five minutes or wait on the phone. It's going to be in your text right now on your phone. Take a look at it. I'll look at it and go, oh, that's my wife's writing or my husband filled that out. Hey, no problem. Now I know I've got the right family. And then I just continue to go on. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Elizabeth, you are such a good sport. That was awesome. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I just picked on you because you said you made phone calls. And so I'm like, okay, you should be able to roll with this. Let me see. Yeah, it's a little different. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, it's now the top of the hour for everybody, right? We got still 78 people in here. There is one more piece I need to go over. And you can stick around for that, or you can go to your uplines if you want to do that. And that piece is, I need to show you Mobile Planet so you know actually how to record the fact that you're making phone calls. Because the system won't know unless you tell it that you're making phone calls. Do all of you want to stick around for like 15 minutes so I can show you how to do that? Yeah. Yes. All right, let's go through that. So the, the phone scripts, you're going to practice tomorrow, first thing in the morning. You may practice with your upline. It's totally fine. Again, this is straightforward. You're reading it and you're going to try to overcome an objection. I don't think you need to spend an inordinate amount of time. I'd much rather have you practice the presentation so that when you have an appointment, you're making money. Okay. So all that being said, I'm going to now open up Mobile Planet. And that is at m.planetaltic.com. All of you should have this uh, ability to log in. You're going to put your first name and last name and then whatever your password is, okay? And then it should look like this. It should come up in a dashboard. Now, tomorrow morning, I'm going to show you everything else about this particular dashboard. It's just that I'm not going to do it now because don't have enough time. You guys all need to go with your uplines. Here's how it works. When you come in here, you have all these things on the left-hand side. The thing that's important for the purposes of making a phone call is you click on My Leads. When you click on My Leads, it will then give you the next screen, which is my schedule, all my leads, my in-town lead pool, road trip, list lead, lapse lead, all that stuff. You don't need to worry about in-town, road trip, list lead, or lapse lead right now. It doesn't affect you, okay? Down here, your upline will click on this and actually put in your name. So I'm sorry, Poleski, is it Elizabeth? Right, Elizabeth Poleski? Yeah, that's me. Like that? Mm -hmm. I don't see you, where are you? Are you in the system as an agent yet? Yes. There you are, Elizabeth Pileski. So I can click on Elizabeth's name and then what happens is I can give her access to my leads, okay? When you have access to leads and you log in here, I will ask you which lead pack do you want to view, your own or whoever's given you the training lead access. So you may see that at some point in the next two weeks, okay? But let's assume for the sake of argument that you can see the lead in here and you're gonna click on all leads. When that pops up, this is every single lead that I have in my lead pack. I have 475 leads right now. The majority of them are all referrals, okay? If you're in the veteran market, you're gonna see veteran leads. If you're in the credit union market, you'll see credit union leads. And when you create referrals, then the referrals will show up just like this one says here for Oscar Ramirez and uh, Selena Redbird and every other one I have that's referred. 
So the last name, then the first name, the city and state that the lead is in, along with their zip code will be listed. The type of lead will be listed here. And then you'll have these four icons. The first one is a little handset, which tells you whether or not there's a valid phone number. The next thing is a little calendar, which tells you if there's an appointment that's set for that lead. The next one is a little bubble, which is a comment. If you made a comment with that lead, it would show up there. And then if you have a little uh, globe here that's in green, that means that the address has been verified by the system. So let's assume that you're going to call uh, Selena Redbird, all right? You're gonna click on her name and then that lead pops up. In this case, it's a veteran family member. So it's a referral, okay, from the veteran market. This says, congratulations, you've been sponsored to receive a barrel and wool kit. All that's fine, okay? So again, you have the name up here, you have the phone number, you have this, the address will be right here. On the right-hand side, you've got a little pen. If I click on that pen, I can actually modify any of the information because that referral is one that I created. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, most of these will not be referrals for, that you have created. So what you're going to do is you're not going to click on a little pencil. You're going to be right back here. But again, you have the little uh, headset, handset for the phone number. You've got the uh, calendar. You've got the comment. And then you have this star. If we remember in the script, anything that you heart, right, in the uh, sponsorship tool, the sponsorship program, you say, well, who are the first two people that you want me to contact? And you put a little heart next to it. That will show up here as a star that is then yellow like that, okay? If I were to visit this person physically, I could map it, I can navigate to it, okay? But we're not, we're doing Zoom, so we don't worry about those two things. Amber invitation is if I wanna send them a, a McGruff child safe kit. Then you've got these four buttons down here, call, appointment, comments, and resolve. For all the leads that you're gonna have access to, you're gonna make phone calls on in these two weeks, I never want you to resolve or click on the resolve button unless your lead, your upline rather, tells you to do so. Because if you remember, you're calling on leads that are not your own. I don't want you to accidentally resolve a lead that your upline doesn't want you to, because when you resolve a lead, it is removed from your inbox. And leads are valuable, right? We don't want to get rid of them unless we're told to. So we're going to come back to these three buttons in a second, but this is what the lead looks like. It has all that information. There's the notes. These are the comment, or sorry, these are the notes that were added. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, welcome uh, my back. System, yeah, my system has decided to uh, not work properly, which is really awesome. But what I was going through is the mobile planet. If you're in your upline and they want you to make calls and they want you to use your cell phone, you would then log into mobile planet on your cell phone using the mobile planet app. I think I talked about that the first day. Is that correct? No. I did or did not? You did. I did. Okay. So you can go into mobile planet and you can, uh, do exactly the same things that I was showing you to get to a lead. When you click on the call button in your mobile planet, it will then use your cell phone or whatever cell phone, or I'm sorry, phone app that you have. It'll ask you which one you want to use, and then it will connect the call for you. From your computer. Sense? I'm sorry? From the computer. Well, in, what I was just talking about is using the app on your phone. If you do it through the computer, it will actually uh, do the same thing, but it will use the computer to make the phone call. So as long as you set the computer up to make an outbound call, you're going to be fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. When you make a phone call, when you click dial, it will then try to connect that call. The next thing it will do is it will ask you basically the disposition of the phone call. Did you, uh, you know, talk to somebody? Was there no answer? Did you leave a voicemail or whatever? I only want you to use two different dispositions on that screen. 
It's either a no answer or bad phone number. No matter what happens on the call, whether you talk to somebody, whether you book an appointment, doesn't matter. I only want you on that screen to use one of two options, bad phone number or no answer, unless your upline tells you something different. And the reason I'm having you all use two is that this way you won't accidentally resolve that lead, right? Because these leads are not yours. You don't want to accidentally get a lead wiped out of somebody's inbox because that could potentially cost them money. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what you're going to do in that particular space. So tonight, what all of you will probably do is practice the phone scripts with your upline, or maybe if there's more than one of you in a class with the upline, they'll have you work together. And either tonight or tomorrow, you'll start making phone calls out. So I know that my Zoom crashed uh, this afternoon. I apologize for that. First thing in the morning, we get back together. I will go through the mobile planet with you again. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Sounds good. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Awesome. So we're done for the night. Go ahead and, and bail out. Uh, and I will see all of you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, everybody.